In today's video, I'm going through six red flags that I noticed in Kevin Hart's new Netflix special, Don't F It Up. I'm Crystal from the School of Manifesting Love, the premier love manifestation and dating program for women. I share content on understanding men and the masculine, dating as a high value woman, and manifestation. So be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss anything. Kobe and I were watching this new limited series on Netflix. It's about Kevin Hart. And it followed him, it looks like over, I don't know, a couple of years. And so each episode has like a little bit of a theme that sort of ties into his life and who he is and all of that. He talks about his mother and like his childhood and there's conversation about his father and then relationships in his life. But one of the sort of things that comes up pretty heavily is that he had an affair. He cheated on his wife, definitely at least once. That's the only one that's touched on, um, you know, possibly other times that we didn't hear that much about, but he cheated on his wife while she was pregnant and it came out because there was a video. It was recorded and you know, essentially there was uh, like an extortion subplot. So someone got this recording of him cheating on his wife, sleeping with this other woman and then there was a video and they were trying to get $10 million from him. So, but as we were watching the whole documentary, there were so many other red flags that came up to me. And what I wanted to do was just look at some of those red flags and see what lessons you can take from this in your own life. The first thing that I noticed was that Kevin values loyalty more strongly than he values fidelity in a marriage. One of the things that people love to still be like, a man is as faithful or as loyal as his options. To me, that's just all wrong. No, that's not true at all. A man is as loyal as his value of loyalty. But in this context, we have to make a distinction here between loyalty and fidelity. The distinction that we're gonna make in this circumstance is that loyalty is sometimes more general. Kevin has an extremely strong sense of loyalty in his friendships. His friends, he expects the utmost loyalty from and he is extremely loyal to them. The loyalty that he feels towards his friend doesn't seem to extend to his wives, his first wife or his current wife. The way that I think about it is I don't believe like a man is only as loyal as options. That doesn't make any sense to me. That means that any man who has great options is always going to explore those options or that men who don't have a lot of options aren't gonna explore them. And we see that's not true. There are extremely wealthy, extremely powerful, extremely good looking men who are faithful to their wives. And there are guys who are broke as a joke and who are ugly, who are gonna cheat on their girlfriends. So that's not how it works. It's really about what a particular man thought. Here's the thing that women sometimes miss about men is that men have a definition within themselves of what it means to be a man. And they don't veer from their own definition. I mean, if they do, it's like a big thing for them. If they move away from what they see as being a man, it's not something they take lightly. It will be very challenging for them. They'll feel really horrible about it and they're gonna do everything they can to move back into alignment with their own definition of what it takes to be a man. What I could see from this series about Kevin and his definition of being a man what he values is providing for his family materially. And we know that he values this because he does it. He does it, he's committed to it, he puts a lot of energy into it. And it makes sense because he came from very, very little. He was not provided for materially, you know, beyond sort of basic needs and survival. And so to him, that is part of his definition of being a man. If I'm going to succeed as a man, that means that I build this empire, that I become a mogul, that I become a billionaire. You know, it's not enough where he is. He is really, really strong about growing it. That's what he values. What he also really values is his loyalty with his friends. So this is sort of red flag number two is his circle of friends and what we saw from them. They are called the, the plastic cup boys is his like core friend group and he's been friends with all of these men for a long time and they're very close, they work together. And you know, it's nice to see, right? Because a lot of times we don't see adult men with close relationships, but sometimes it's not just how it looks. There's some other issues at play there. You know, these are red flags more for his wife or you know, his third wife or whatever, whoever is gonna be in a relationship with him next, but also things that you can sort of take into your relationships and really think about things that you might wanna pay attention to or notice or see from a different angle. They are very much bonded over the shared experience that they have of not having fathers present for them growing up. He talked about this sort of core group of friends. I don't remember how many there were, like seven or eight maybe. 
And I don't know if every single one of them didn't have a relationship with his father. However, it was highlighted for several of them that that was a thing that brought them together. Kevin's father, um, he wasn't completely out of his life, but he was a drug addict when he was a kid. And so obviously that is going to be an absent father. One of the other friends, his father died when he was young. You know, several, several of them had fathers that walked out on them, that were never with the mother, that didn't stay with the mother. So there was all of these different things with their fathers. And that was sort of a core part of their group that came up kind of the heavy, heavily emphasized thing that they all have bonded over these absentee fathers in their life. On the one hand, it looks really sweet, right? Like, oh, they have something in common. They all wanna be better fathers for their own children. Like on the surface, it doesn't seem like a problem. This negative aspect, as they all see it as negative, none of them are saying, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. So this negative or, you know, really in this context, traumatic, aspect of their lives has now become a cornerstone of their bond and their relationship. Consciously, they're all going to hold themselves to at least a slightly higher standard when it comes to being a father. They're looking at their lives and saying, our fathers weren't present for us. We're not going to do that for our kids. We're going to be more present for our kids. But subconsciously, there's still that, that code of abandonment that is underlying everything. And they're not aware of how they're recreating those patterns even now. Part of the problem here is that they did not have the kind of families that they would want or that might be like an ideal modeled for them. They don't have an ideal. They're not working towards something in particular. They're just thinking, I see what my father did. That was wrong. So I'm going to try to do something at least a little bit different. You know, how different it's actually ending up being Hard to say, right? We don't really know. They're not moving towards an ideal. They're just trying to do something different than their own fathers. But that theme of abandonment is still within them. Now, we're sort of getting to the crux of the issue here. And the reason why it is problematic that his friend group are holding on to this thing of like, none of us had fathers and look what we're doing now. They are holding on to that as a central part of their identity. This is, this is the big part. This is what you really, really need to understand. We always act in accordance with our identity. It's with it. It's the way that we see the world. It's the way that we operate in the world. And whatever pieces of ourselves we hold as part of our identity, we act in alignment with them. So when you're holding on to, I was abandoned by my father, I was abandoned by my mother, any of these things, you are going to continue acting in accordance with it. This doesn't mean that all hope is lost. If you went through something traumatic, if you have at your identity some sort of trauma, some sort of really hard thing that you went through as a child, it doesn't mean like you're screwed. You're so not at all. What it does mean is that if you're going to create what you actually want in your life, you need to distance yourself from that part of your identity. That can't stay at the core of your identity because a person who's always abandoned is going to continue being abandoned. A person who is unlovable or unworthy, when that's a part of your identity, then you're going to keep getting results that are aligned with that. What we're seeing with Kevin and these group of, this group of men that he's friends with is that at their identity, at the core of their identity and also their bond as a group is this father wound. And you know, a lot of people have father wounds. It's not something that cannot be healed or changed or you know, evolved and transformed into something better. But if you don't do that work, it just sort of manifests in its most natural form, which is as low self-esteem, a sense of unworthiness, a sense of being unlovable, um, you know, not having faith and belief that things are going to work out for you, not having faith that people are going to stay with you, you know, this fear of abandonment, all of these things that we're seeing. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this father wound that they all have and the way that they sort of speak to each other is that there seems to be a greater commitment to being better fathers than they had, but not necessarily better husbands. And this is really problematic. This is another red flag. You cannot prioritize being a good father over being a good husband. I mean, you can, I shouldn't say you can't. Of course you can, a lot of people do. People do it all the time, but it does not bode well for your relationships. And as we can see, it did not bode well for Kevin's relationships. You can't prioritize your kids over your spouse. Your spouse has to be your first priority. And obviously not to the detriment of your children, take care of your children, make sure all of their needs are met, make sure they get all the love and support and attention and all of the stuff that they need. 
but also not to the detriment of your relationship with your partner. That seems to be the mindset that all of these guys have. The best thing that you can do for your kids is to have a stable relationship. And I am not talking about like, oh, staying together just for the kids. No, obviously, if the relationship isn't going to work, it's not going to work. There's no point in staying together because that still doesn't create stability for the kids. If you can create an actual happy, loving, stable relationship, that is the best thing that you can do. So if your relationship falls apart because you've put so much focus on the kids and you haven't given the same sort of attention and focus to your spouse, that's a big problem. There's nothing better for kids than seeing that, you know, their parents are a unit that their mother is cherished and taken care of and loved and treated well and that their father is respected and cared for and gets what he needs. That's the best thing. That's the stability that you ultimately want to create. And so when the focus, when the emphasis is too heavily on just being a good father, sort of to the detriment of being a good husband and how important it is to be a good partner for the woman that you've chosen, that's a problem. Now, the other thing that I wanna add on about his friend group, and this is really more of a concept of consciousness that, you know, just bear with me because this will be interesting once you understand it. So there's this concept of pendulums. A pendulum is essentially ener any energetic structure, any energetic structure that starts gaining momentum because of its adherence, because of the people who are feeding the energy. So a pendulum, can be anything. Obviously, the government is a pendulum, but also in America, we have two main political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. Those are pendulums. Schools are pendulums. But then also on a smaller scale, we'll see pendulums within a friend group. We'll see a pendulum even within a marriage. You know, there is a dynamic within a relationship that is outside and has energy beyond just the two individuals. They have their own dynamic. And then on a really large scale, we see it with wars. You know, if there's two sides to a war, each side is a pendulum that has its own momentum. And then the war itself will take on energy and then becomes its own pendulum. So looking at Kevin's friend group as a pendulum, this was another thing that was very, very interesting. So his friend group has an energy. They have a dynamic. Now, like most stars, Kevin is at the top of a pendulum. He is sort of a favorite of the pendulum, but also he is not outside of the energy of it. So this was really interesting. When he talked about the cheating scandal that he was involved in, he describes, you know, a couple of interesting things with his friends that he didn't have any of his friends around him. He was like, I didn't have my circle around me. I didn't have my circle around me. That's what he said. And then they sort of backtrack and they give us, you know, the fuller picture of it, which is that he decided he was going to Vegas and he asked a couple of his friends and he was asking them on a Thursday and he was planning on going on Friday. And so one of the guys is like, well, it was last minute and I'm married. I knew my wife wasn't going to go for that. Here they all are saying, we aren't going with you on this particular trip. You're, you're kind of on your own for this because we're going to be with our families. But then also that he went anyway. When they're talking about how they operate as a friend group, they were sort of saying how there's like, there's power, there's safety in being together as a group because if someone starts getting out of line, someone else will be like, bro, what are you doing? Like, this isn't the right thing to do or don't go there or, you know, you're going too far, whatever. Sort of keeping each other in line. So on the surface, it's like, oh, that's great. I love that his friends have like a good influence on him and are helping keep him in line. But on the other hand, it's like, you're a grown man. Why is that even needed? Why is it that if you don't have a friend telling you that that's not a good idea, don't do that, you're gonna do things to get yourself in trouble? They seem to know that this is part of their dynamic, that like someone needs to be around to keep Kevin in line. He's experienced this before or many times or it's something that he's often close to doing. But where they draw the line is it being out public and her being humiliated and there being an extortion scandal. He knows this about himself apparently, and apparently all of his friends do too, and yet he still went. So why did I even mention pendulums? Because it's interesting to see sort of the energy dynamics of some things. One of the things that will happen is that if someone starts to move away from the pendulum, if they are believing things or thinking thoughts and they're rebelling against the pendulum, they will either be destroyed or be kicked out. Kevin cheated on his wife. It came out very publicly. They all banded around him. You know, in some ways, it's like, it's really nice. They're very loyal. They forgive and move on. And that's a beautiful thing in some ways. But what that tells us is that like within that pendulum, cheating on your wife is not 
an unforgivable offense. That's something they sort of band around and move on from. It's not a shared value in that pendulum that you have to be faithful to your wife. So honestly, if I were married to any of those guys, I would be very concerned because that means that like their definitions of being a man, it doesn't exclude a man who cheats on his wife. It's kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say it's not a big deal because we can't know exactly how they responded, but it certainly wasn't something that is going to get them kicked out or destroyed. None of them said, we can't stand by you. This was a horrible, what you did was wrong. That was a terrible, terrible thing to do. Sort of like, okay, now what? The way that this whole thing about the cheating came out is because of this sort of extortion subplot. Kevin slept with this woman, someone recorded it, and then sent the video out and you know, we're trying to get $10 million from him. So there's this extortion subplot. This guy who had been part of the Plastic Cup Boys unofficially is the one who was thought to have planted the woman. I'm like unclear on what exactly they're claiming happened, but definitely is the one who put the video camera in the hotel room where Kevin was with this other woman. This is interesting because the extortionist was driven out. He was like, he who shall not be named. They were devastated by that. We see Kevin's reactions to basically three different Di three different things. We see his reaction to the cheating scandal coming out. We see his reaction to the extortion subplot that someone did to him. We also see how Kevin reacts when he did something that really sort of violated his own definition of being a man. He got into a fight with one of his friends on a plane and just was drunk and stupid and was yelling at this guy. And so he also apologized about that. And so looking at these three different events that came up. But before I get into that, I sort of want to talk a little bit about, so that's obviously a red flag. And then also Kevin's apology itself was a huge, huge red flag. His apology to, I mean, probably not to his wife. I'm sure that he privately apologized to her, but his public apology to his wife about the situation or to the public, unclear who it's really supposed to be for, but the apology that he made, he, he put it on Instagram. And it was his apology essentially. I'm at a place in my life where I feel like I have a target on my back. And because of that, I need to make smart decisions. And I was just like, what? That, that's what he said. I feel like I'm at a place where I have a target on my back and because of that, I need to make, uh, no. You should make smart decisions because you're a smart person. Make smart decisions because it's better for your life. It's better for the people that you care about. It's going to get you further. You don't make smart decisions because you think that you have a target on your back. He maybe has a target on his back, but like maybe he doesn't. Who knows? That may very well be in his head. But like, don't make your smart decisions because of that. Just decide to make smart decisions. How about is a better way. Make smart decisions because you value your marriage, because you care about your wife, because you respect your family structure. Those are all better reasons to make smart decisions rather than just because you have a target on your back. So that was like really weird. I, I don't really understand why that would be what he leads with. I have a target on my back, but anyway. Oh, the other thing is like make smart decisions because you have self-respect because like you're worthy of making smart decisions for yourself. So when I was thinking about that, another thing that came up is that like on some level there is sort of maybe a sense of lack of self-respect or a sense of unworthiness. And this sort of circles back to that whole father wound that he has. There's this concept called upper limits. And the first time I heard about this was from a book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And basically what he describes there is that everyone has a set point for things. So we have a set point for happiness, a set point for love, a set point for wealth, you know? And so it's basically how much we feel comfortable with. It's our personal state of equilibrium. And we don't veer too far away. So if someone has a set point, let's say that your set point is here and you go way above it, you know, let's say you get a huge raise, you come into a lot of money. The easiest way we can see this is with lottery winners. So it's like their set point for wealth could have been here and then they win the mega millions. And their wealth is up here. And most lottery winners lose their money. Why? Because their set point never raised. And so they will do what they can to return to equilibrium. This happens in way less obvious ways also though. You know, if you have a certain set point and all of a sudden you really are loving your job and you're getting a great relationship and you know, you're getting in good health, you might do things to self-sabotage. Now, sometimes this is done really consciously where you go home and, well, this isn't conscious. If you pick a fight with your boyfriend, you're probably not doing it consciously, but you're aware that you're 
starting something, right? But also it sometimes happens in way, way more insidious ways like we'll get sick or, you know, we'll hurt ourselves or we just start stubbing our toes or, you know, you start speeding and you're getting traffic tickets or parking tickets, just all sorts of things like that can be a form of sort of self-sabotage where you're trying to bring yourself back into equilibrium. So this was, a, this is a tangent, but it's a good one. My sense with Kevin was not that he has some sort of uh, sex addiction or a search for power, which is what a lot of rich, wealthy men do, is they're like, what can I get away with? Now, is there an aspect of him that sort of wants to see what he can get away with? Probably. I'm sure that's always there a little bit. What I get more is that he's sabotaging himself. There's a little bit of self-sabotage there. There's this sense of unworthiness, and that can be a very deep thing. So often, when people have a fear of abandonment, which Kevin probably did. He lost his mother, who's the person who really raised him, and his father was very much absent. And that creates, it can create a big gaping hole for someone. And if you do not make the effort to really heal that, it can stay there. And so obviously he was able to move past it in some areas of his life with his career. Obviously, he's very successful. He makes a lot of money, but maybe not in his relationships. In his relationships, he may still be feeling that sense of unworthiness, that sense of not being lovable, that sense of not being good enough. And so that can manifest in a couple of different ways. One is that we self-sabotage, but part of it is also how far can I go before this person abandons me as well? If I cheat on my wife, she's gonna leave me and that's gonna prove that I am not worthy of love. And I knew it all along. I knew this whole time I wasn't worthy of love and now, now she's gone. Proved it, I knew it. We want to affirm what we already believe about ourselves, and this is almost always not consciously. But the way that we view ourselves, what I usually call your love blueprint, it is very strong. It is the way that we view the world. And so when things aren't lining up with it, it's again with these set points. We try to bring ourselves back into equilibrium. We wanna prove what we already believe about ourselves. I think there could be an aspect of that as well. So yes, have self-respect. He may have been lacking it. He may be lacking it but definitely in that moment he was lacking. The next thing he said was, I made an error in judgment and I put myself in an environment where only bad things can happen. Now this is interesting because this almost sounds like taking responsibility. It kind of sounds like I, I, I made an error in judgment, sounds like I'm taking responsibility, but not quite. Because what he's saying is I put myself in an environment where only bad things can happen. He's really trying to distance himself from what he did. He's not saying, I did something really wrong. I made a horrible choice and I'm really ashamed of it. He's not saying that. He said, I put myself in an environment. He is trying to make himself a victim of his environment. He's saying, it was inevitable. I was in this environment. I didn't have my friends around me. So he's making it sound like he's apologizing for something, but he's really abdicating responsibility. Can't help it. Can't help it, he didn't have his friends around him, he's in this environment that he somehow ended up in. And the thing that was really interesting, and this is another way that you can sort of see how pendulums work, is that everyone sort of bought into it. When his friends in this series were talking about what happened, they were using that same very passive distance language. One of his friends said, you know, this came out and he sat us all down, and somehow there was a tape of him and this girl. And I was just like, somehow. No, it's not, it's, what? Somehow there was a tape of him and this woman because he slept with this woman. Again, there was sort of distancing and they're looking at the tape as if that was the bad event. Now I'm not canceling out. If someone's trying to extort someone and setting up a tape, that's a horrible, disgusting, despicable thing to do. But also he was in this situation. If he hadn't been sleeping with the other woman, there wouldn't have been a tape to put out. You know, it's like, there's no dirty laundry to air if you don't soil the sheets. So that was interesting to me that like his friends were sort of in on this, like, oh, somehow this happened, this thing outside of him that he had no control over happened. So he says this whole bit and then he's like, I'm also not going to allow a person to have financial gain off my mistakes. I'd rather fess up to my mistakes. Okay, valid. Like you don't have to pay this guy $10 million. That's a lot of money and you know, whatever, it's extortion. Not like, it's not okay. But he said fess up, but like he wasn't really fessing up. He waited until he was pushed into a corner. So it's like, does that really count? I don't know, definitely less so. 
Like he's already been found out. You know, he said at one point, like, oh, the hardest thing was telling my wife. And I was like, you didn't tell your wife. She already knew. And then you had to like explain yourself. So like that sucks, but she already knew. She found out because someone else told her. You didn't tell her. This was not something that he did and was like, wow, I made some, I made a horrible mistake. I did something wrong. I have to tell my wife. I gotta let her know before, you know, before this gets out. He didn't say any of that. That would have been a different situation, right? He was really waiting until someone was like, oh, if you don't, if you don't give me $10 million, I'm gonna tell everybody. His wife found out via her DMs. Someone DM'd her a video, which is just awful. Like, oh my God, I can't imagine going through that. It's, it's a betrayal. He, he, he cheated on her. So yeah, I felt like he was a little bit seeing himself as the victim. He's the victim of an extortionist, but also it's a mess of his own creation. The other big problem that I had with his apology, and again, this was his public declaration apology, I don't even know. Um, so this, I'm sure he apologized and had many, many conversations with his wife separately, but I hate when men lump their wives and their children together, especially for something like this. Obviously, if a man cheats, it's going to have an impact on his kids. It's embarrassing for them. It's humiliating for them. It's a whole thing for them also. So I'm not saying like, oh, the kids aren't affected. Of course they're affected, it's awful. You don't wanna see your father like that. You don't wanna know about that. You don't want everyone in the world knowing. So I'm not saying it doesn't hurt the kids. Obviously it hurts the kids, it's horrible for them. But it's a separate thing for the wife. And I feel like this comes up a lot, right? Is men will say like, you know, I'm so ashamed because like I wanna be a better example for my kids. No bro, like just be better. And also be better for your wife. I don't understand this thing about like it just being for your kids. Like your wife should be at the top. Like your wife is the most important. And for women, your husband is the most important. Like your spouse has to come first. He didn't say, you know, I wanna be an example for my kids. I've heard this in other things, but that was sort of the whole vibe and like lumping them together, you know, my wife and my kids. The other thing with the kids is that his kid with his current wife, the one that, you know, he cheated on is a baby. He doesn't know anything about it. So he's really talking about his kids from a former relationship. So they're gonna have a totally, totally, totally different experience of this than his current wife. I didn't like that he lumped them together. So that's just my two cents on that. But side note that I did notice about the wife, when she was talking about it, the first time that she mentioned it, or you know, maybe it was edited this way, I don't know, I have no way of knowing. But the first thing that we hear her say is, how could you let this happen? And so to me, I was like, either she's sort of buying into this, Kevin Hart is the passive victim to this thing that happened, or it could be that maybe there's some allowance for that in their relationship, that there is some allowance for him being with other women. And we, as just you know, random people watching, are seeing it as a little bit like, oh, he's cheating on her. But maybe, maybe in their relationship, he's allowed to, you know, have a little hanky panky on the side. And that's not a big deal. I did think that that was an interesting thing. You know, how could you let this happen? He didn't let anything happen. He was an active participant in sex with another person and then it was recorded. So that was just an interesting side note. Um, you know, and if it's the case that that is something that is allowed in the relationship, that he is allowed to be with other people, you know, have at it. If that's how you want to run your relationship, it may be that, you know, she put some thought in it. It was like, I'd rather, you know, stick out the relationship and allow you to do that. I mean, historically speaking, that was certainly quite standard. I mean, it's a very new concept that like we really demand absolute faithfulness and fidelity in relationships for, you know, as long as marriage has been around, that hasn't necessarily been so key, at least on the part of the man, obviously for the woman it's a little bit different, but it did make me sort of curious, like maybe that's an aspect of the relationship, but he crossed the line by letting it out and having her publicly humiliated. The other thing, when we're talking about the wife and the extortion, there's, I know there's so many different aspects to this. When the wife was talking about this guy who extorted, she said, you know, he was crying for days about it. He was so hurt. Everyone's talking about how hurt Kevin was by this betrayal. And it wasn't lost on him that he had betrayed his wife and then he was betrayed by his friend. It, it, it was not lost on him. He definitely noticed that. But the reaction to the betrayal of someone within the friend group, and it's like, there it is. That guy was gone. He who shall not be named. He is not a part of the group because that is like a betrayal of the highest level in their world. Boss, that is Kevin's trainer. He said, 
The man code we believe in was just violated to the nth degree. He's like, I don't even want to talk about it. I can't talk about it because this is just so beyond me. Like I cannot even deal with this. This is what one of his, his friends slash trainer said. And I was like, there it is right there. Betraying your friend for money, that is beyond their man code. Within their pendulum, that is not acceptable. But cheating on your wife, far lesser degree. We can stand by you if you cheat on your wife. If you're disloyal to us, you're out. We, we can't talk about you. We want nothing to do with you. You're dead to us. And that was everyone's attitude. It was just like, what happened? That man betraying you? That is like the worst thing we could ever imagine. What a horrible thing. Like, how are we going to get past this? It was devastating for them, right? Like, that was, that was horrible. Like, they do not see him as a man anymore. He violated the, the communal definition they have of what it means to be a man. Cheating on your wife does not violate that. There was another, there was another incident that we saw. And that was when Kevin got into a fight with Boss, his trainer, on a plane. They were on a flight, they were drunk, they were playing cards, and Kevin was just talking nonsense, you know? He was just pestering him about, like, he was trying to prove his manliness in some way, you know, essentially trying to get Boss to say, like, without you, Kevin, I would have nothing. Kevin was like, do you have a house? Do you have a house? Do you have a house? Like, do you, like what would you do? Like, would you have enough without me? Like. He was being a real dick about it. It was quite obnoxious and he was drunk and boss was just like, I've been making money, like I'll be fine. And like, I'm grateful to you, but like, no, I'm not gonna say that like you made me. That's what Kevin was sort of getting at. So I got, it got very rowdy. And um, you know, when they landed, when the flight landed, there were police there. This was like a private flight. And so obviously the pilot or flight attendants or whatever called the, let the cops know that there was this fight on board. And Kevin was just like, if it had gotten any more intense, then Boss and I both probably would have been arrested. Now, the reason that this is of note is because this was a time when Kevin messed up and the way that he approached it was like a world away from how he approached this cheating that he did. When he's talking to the camera about this and he said, I fucked up, I was wrong. He said something else and I can't remember, but he, was just like, oh, he owned it. He said, I fucked up. And I was like, oh, okay. So it turns out he knows how to apologize. He knows how to take responsibility. And then the other thing he said was, he's like, there are moments you realize you are nowhere, nowhere near where you need to be. That was one of those moments from him. That was one of those moments for him was when he got into this fight with his friend. He was like, this is not where I wanna be. This is not the man I wanna be. This is not how I wanna live my life. He had that realization and it seemed to really affect him. And then he read off, he read off what he texted his friends. And I'm gonna read this because this was just very, very interesting. He said, attention fellas, I am taking full responsibility for yesterday. I am wrong. I apologize. That was the corniest and most disrespectful thing I've ever done or been a part of. I'm gonna check myself. I have been on edge ever since blank did what he did. Okay, so this is where he starts to lose me. He was really on a roll with this apology. I was like, all right, he's, I'm gonna check myself. Like I was wrong. It's like, he gets it. He's fully taking ownership for what he did wrong. When someone is apologizing to you, that is what you want. You want to hear them say that they are taking ownership. Why? Because that shows awareness and it shows growth. What was striking though is that, you know, he said that was the most disrespectful and corniest thing I've ever done. Really? That's odd because you cheated on your wife. Seems like he probably cheated on his first wife as well. I don't know all the in and outs of, you know, the Kevin Hart situation, but I believe that he cheated on his first wife as well. He certainly got together with his current wife before he was officially divorced. And, you know, I have thoughts on, you know, dating someone who's separated versus divorced and all that, but whatever, I'll go into that another time. He said, I'm going to check myself. So it's like, he knows what it looks like to take at least more, if not complete responsibility. Then he everything goes off the rails. Cause he says, I've been on edge ever since blank did what he did. So this is again, he's distancing himself. He's saying like, look, yes, I was wrong, but also I'm really tense. You can understand that, right? I wish he had just continued with where he was. Cause this is, I mean, that's not really so much of an apology once you're making excuses. Um, but he sort of saves it. Cause he says, I have no right to take my frustration from that incident out on you. Cause I promised you it was my job to lead you. Yesterday I failed in my job. I will get my shit together and do better. Okay, so pretty good apology, right? So, so, so much better than his apology to his wife, which is very telling. He knows how to take responsibility. He knows what it looks like to make an apology when you've done something wrong, when you realize you've done something wrong. 
and he did it in one situation and he didn't do it in another. Again, this goes back to how he defines himself as a man. For him, being disrespectful and starting a fight when he's drunk with his friend on a plane, that violates his own sense of what it means to be a man. Cheating on his wife and sleeping with someone else does not violate his sense of what it means to be a man. It does not seem to have the same gravitas as this ridiculous fight that he got in. So that's a big red flag. That is very, very revealing. But as I said, it could be that this is a part of their arrangement. You know, it seems to me that what's important to him is providing for his family and maybe for, you know, his wife, that's what's important to her to her too, is that, you know, they stay together as a family, that he provides for them materially and like takes care of them. How can you apply this to your own life? The first thing that we can sort of touch on here is when is it a good idea to take back a cheater? Now, I think there is something to be said with doing what you can to make a marriage work. You know, can someone move on? Can someone be better or do something different after they've made a mistake? Yes, they definitely can. But what does it take? It takes an actual dedication to doing something different. So before I would take back a cheater, I would want to know what's going to be different now. Why should I believe you? What have you done? And this isn't just words. Words, flowers, those gestures, they don't mean so much. What have you actually done on yourself so that I know that things are going to be different going forward? You want to see some action. You know, I've gone through therapy. I hired a life coach. I, you know, enrolled in a 12-step program. Something, some sort of action that shows that like, I am doing what I can to change. We know he's cheated more than once on his current wife. It seems like he may have cheated in the past. Like maybe that's just part of his identity. So if he's not interested in shifting that, then you're not gonna see much of a change. How else to apply this to your own life? You want to figure out what a man values. Does he value loyalty? But does he also value fidelity in his marriage and faithfulness to a partner? Or does he just value loyalty to his friends? Does he think it's a bigger betrayal if a friend turns his back on you or a spouse? Lastly, you want to think about how a man identifies. What does he see as being at the core of himself? Do, does he hold his wounds from his childhood? Is that a core part of his identity? Does it, being abandoned, is that a poor part of his identity? Does his victimhood, the aspect of his life where he is a victim or was a victim or was victimized, is that sort of core to who he is? That is something you're going to want to be aware of because that's gonna be the sort of thing that a man is going to play out over and over again. So I hope that you love this video. If you did, please be sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.